Thanks for coming. Hey, thanks for having me. I've never done anything like this before. This is like my fourth time. Feels so. prestigious. Uh, you deserve prestigious. Thank you. Yeah, I think so. Um, I brought you in today because you're a fellow artist. Mm-hmm. You, um, I was trying to figure this out earlier. Mm. Tattooist or tattooer? You know, I call myself a tattoo artist. I used to like the sound of, I think you can say anything really. Some people say tattooist. Some, be, some people say tattooer. I like to say tattoo artist. But I, and someone actually phrased it to me one time. And I liked it because because there's actually now tattooers who are just not artists. <laughs> they don't consider themselves artists. They've never spent any time honing the craft of art. Okay. Uh, and they just want to do tattoos, I guess. I don't know, for presumably because they're cool. Yeah, they are. And cool. so, okay. I, you know, someone once told me, we're like, oh, they're tattooers. But you're, like, we, we're, we're tattoo artists because, you know, we have that kind of element that we're trying to create an important real distinction. art, you know? Yeah. yeah. And the design components and everything. Uh, whereas a gr- evidently a great proportion of the industry is taking images off the internet and printing them out. Facsimile and, on somebody. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. I can photocopy that onto yeah. you with this needle. And tattoo artists, tattoo printer. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Is that distinction that, was made to someone I can't remember who it was sort of sort of made that distinction for me and I was like oh yeah okay well, I'd like to associate myself with the or align myself in yeah. the artist column there because that's an important I consider it an important part of what we do yeah I think it yeah. sets it apart for sure yeah. I think the first if this is where my head goes to on this but if they ever create a 3D printing tattoo machine that you can just attach to your it'll be called the tattooer <laughs> yeah, 3000 that, or tattooer, something right exactly yeah that's not going to be the tattoo yeah. artist 3000 yeah and then everyone's going to take that off their business cards cuz it'll be a proprietary yeah yeah you'll you'll, you'll owe kickbacks <laughs> yeah. every time somebody calls you up um yeah. artist yeah that's why you're here um yeah. i've seen what you do i have received what you do Thank you. It's pretty. It's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I came back a couple more times. Uh-huh. I intend on further attending those types of service. And I'll be, always be looking forward to it. Um, Thank you. So, the whole premise behind why I started this, which maybe helps get this whole thing rolling as well, was I was unable to do my art, I guess, which is play guitar. I couldn't hold a guitar for a while, so I started just talking to people about it. Yeah. Uh, backstory what you what you're doing to stay sharp those kinds of things so um why don't we start there with where did this where if you have thought on it at all yet or right now even where did this start for you the tat the uh, all of it i mean this is a perfect josh question because i tend to answer any question with a story and then that within that story there's sort of other stories and the timeline bounces back and forth and so yeah. i could answer the question in <laughs> probably only complicated ways yeah like so a guy ritchie begin. film like start yeah, like somewhere a, in the middle yeah. jump around to the end and then go back to the middle and yeah far less organized than a guy ritchie film but yeah I've, I've always drawn ever since i was a kid um my mom when i was growing up she she had gone to university for fine art and she she's always been an artist and so she and then when i was a kid she worked at the arts center in calgary there's a couple uh establishments that were run by the city and they're called the well one was the north mount pleasant art center it was an art center in the mount pleasant area and she kind of ran that joint and she was always you know she knew that i loved doing it and so she'd foster my you know wanting to do that kind of thing by putting me in this class in this class and it was everything from throwing pottery on wheels to cartooning classes or painting or you know ever since from a young age kind of and and i always loved doing it particularly cartooning uh and so i i did that forever and then as i got older you know kind of young adulthood 19 and 20 i sort of was pretty heavily influenced by alex gray and other visionary artists like that and i kind of got more into this sort of visionary art genre i suppose you'd say um 
and I, w- I always like loved the idea of of being a tattoo artist because I loved tattoos and I always thought they were so cool. Um, but I was a musician at the same time, kind of right sort of, I was in a band in high school, but I kind of lost all my bandmates when I moved to Vancouver and I was sort of more just doing my own thing, writing songs by myself. Um, and I remember thinking, Oh, I'm going to like be a musician. I remember talking to my mom about it. <laughs> she went to university for art and she's like, she's like, you know, kind of little reality check, like, yeah, it's pretty hard to make a living as an artist. Yeah. I may want to think of a backup plan or something that's going to be a little bit more dependable. Yeah. And so I just like, honestly just was like, yeah, geez, you're right. This is crazy. I can't do, I can't well, do you're laying in bed art one for a day living. Staring at the ceiling going, was, what am I doing? I, well, I, and I never really did give it my all or anything. I was just like, oh, you know, that's, that's right. This is very unlikely to try and do this for a living. So I'll just go to school and get a degree, have an arts degree, and then, you know, work a job. Work and then I'll, I'll get to do art in my free time kind of thing. You know, that's what, that's what I did. And I went and I got a degree, an arts degree, which is, you know, not as valuable as it once was in the job market, <laughs> especially with what I took was anthropology and archaeology. It's because I was interested in the subject, not because I was thinking, oh, this will translate into a lucrative career of yeah. <laughs> any kind. And then, yeah. And so, yeah, I, after university, Mariah and I moved up to Grand Prairie from Vancouver I got a job working as an archaeologist. I uh, was paying no money, which was fine for me. I didn't really mind. But then um, the concept of having kids was brought up and quickly translated into a reality. So I needed to get a better paying job. So I kind of got into the you know oil field industry and civil construction industry and got into a sort of a professional, safety professional and quality management role and did that for seven years. So I was very far removed from any kind of art scene or habit for that matter. And, um, and so going from that to actually getting the tattooing was a bit of a funny story because I actually went, I'm really giving you the long version. I was going to say, so you've taken like seven (laughs) years off. How far off are we? Like, are, is it like I haven't even opened up a sketchbook or yeah, I, haven't even, I, mean, I haven't even said pencil out loud? I haven't. What does that look like? I haven't really, at this point in time, I hadn't really done very much drawing in, yeah, years, like four or five years. It's an important distinction because, I yeah. mean, it happens, I think it has happened in every interview so far, but certainly just people I talk to, it's more often than not that it, like, just kind of fades out almost uh, subconsciously. Like it just sort yeah. of starts to just be, you know, unavailable. You're not making the time to do it. And then yeah, that kind of life takes over yeah. thing and you don't prioritize this thing. That's not. Yeah. And for me, it was like a necessity. You like don't even realize. I think it's like getting fat slowly where you're like, <laughs> you're like, it's too relevant. When did I become 300 pounds? <laughs> you just see that same person getting a little fatter. You just <laughs> stop doing that thing a little more every day. And then pretty soon you're like, wait a minute, it's been seven years. I used to, I used to do things. Yeah. Where, where did those go? Yeah, no. And that's right. It wasn't very much an every day, every single day would make visual art and make some music of some kind and and yeah and it kind of it totally all got set aside for other priorities and <clears throat> and yeah so anyway I was chasing other goals I, at the at the time I was focusing on my career trying to get uh, advanced I was trying to I was trying to go for the professional designation in health and safety in Canada which is called the Canadian registered safety professional Hmm. Exciting, and uh, I figured it was going to be a piece of cake because I'm was pretty good in university. I kind of knew the game and knew how to get straight A's. And as long as I put the work in right when I needed to, I kind of came out hmm. on top, and it was all good. Yeah. And so I figured, okay, well, I'm good at that. So for this CRSP thing, you kind of got to put together a pretty heavy application. Then you go for a committee interview. 
if that all passes and meets their criteria, then you get to write the exam. If you write the exam, then you get to pay your dues and then like your finite, you know, they charge you a, a, a subscription theory, you know, a fee, and then they give you your badge kind of thing. And so I got through the first parts of the application and the interview, which was, you know, more significant than I thought it was going to be. And then I came to the exam and I was like, okay, this is going to be no problem. And I remember writing this thing. It was three hours long. And I honestly walked out of there like feeling violated. It was just (laughs) brutal. It was three hours of multiple choice questions where every question was, or every, every answer was right. And you had to pick the best one. The most so it was right. E- yeah, the most right. So yeah. it was like, it was either like a total trivial knowledge thing. Like what does the new Brunswick building code say about this? You know, and yet it was like, there was one right answer for that. Um, but the other ones were like best judgment questions. So it's like, it's supposed to, you're supposed to, in order to answer correctly, you, you kind of combine knowledge, experience, and good judgment. Yeah. And so I Split remember just hairs. like, I remember just like the first time taking this test, like I even took a prep course for it. And I was like, the prep course was not representative of this exam at all. Yeah. It was so hard. And I walked out of there thinking like, I mean, I have no real idea because every answer seemed like a plausible yeah. answer on this test. And it was grueling. And I remember getting out of there thinking like, probably I failed. <laughs> And as it turned out, I did. You have to wait six weeks or something for your results to come in. And then they came in. And sure enough, I had bombed along with 70 other people, 70% of other people who wrote this exam. They make it hard. They make it really hard. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to sign up again for this thing. And if you fail it twice in a row, you're not even allowed to apply for another three years. Oh, dang. I think. And so I was like, I was like, really got (laughs) to. win this time and so I, I buckled down and studied my ass off even more for it and and i took the exam and six weeks later i found out that i actually got a pretty good mark on it um and i passed and so it was one of one of became 11. one of the some 2000 crsps in canada and so i was feeling pretty good about myself i was thinking okay you know like i can i set my mind to this and i did it and I feel a sense of accomplishment, you know, it's kind of a trivial thing is like, it's not really, you don't need this professional designation to be hired at 99% of places, yeah. but it was just something that I wanted to do and I did it. So I was feeling good about myself. And at the same time, I was also focusing on not slowly becoming a fat guy as we previously <laughs> talked about. I was like running, I was training for a half marathon at the same time. And I, and uh, that was kind of like, hard too i'm and i ended up doing it i ended up running the calgary police half marathon of that year and uh it's hard man it's like it's hard to do that i remember crossing the finish line thinking they shouldn't call this half Half? anything half anything like (laughs) yeah because uh, this is really it's hard unjust. to do. And now yeah, it's not just, it doesn't feel like half of anything. It was like and, too much of something, <laughs> too much running. Yeah. But I did it. And I also felt this like corresponding sense, sense of accomplishment. And so I was kind of in this headspace of like, I can do whatever I set my mind to as long as I'm willing to put in the work. Cause that's really yeah. what it took in both cases. There was not any crossing the finish line of this race. If I didn't train and there wasn't any passing that exam, unless I've, worked my ass off to figure it out and so i was just in this headspace and you know i wasn't planning on using that positive you know feeling in any specific way but it just like sort of happened that it kind of came out at um so every year mariah and i my wife and Uh, sometimes our kids will join us. We go to the North country fair, which is a music festival outside of slave Lake area. Drift pile. Drift pile. Yes. Yes. Best town name ever. All 12 people that'll watch this. will know that. Yeah. (laughs) Um, and every year just for a fun thing, you know, for years and years and years, even when we used to go to other festivals in our early twenties and stuff, I would do henna on friends and family and just for fun. 
just because it's like a fun thing that I like to do. I always mm-hmm. like doing patterns and mandalas and decorative stuff in my, that, that sort of mandala aspect worked into my visionary a lot, visionary art a lot when I was in my early twenties. And so that's a lot of, how to do sort of Mendy designs and mandalas and that kind of ornamental pattern work type thing in henna, which is for those who don't know, is a stain uh, that you apply to the skin uh, and it kind of looks like a temporary tattoo sort of thing. Lasts for a couple weeks mm-hmm. kind of on your skin. And every year that I would do this, my friends would be like, man, you should really like become a tattoo artist. Like I would get this design tattooed on me. And I was all those years in this headspace of like, no way I can do that. I don't know, but it, you know, it's what are the chances of actually getting to do I have a professional safety designation. Yeah. <laughs> And so, yeah, this year, that this one year of accomplishing these other goals, I was at the North Country Fair doing henna on my friends. And I remember one of them said, man, like, you should become a tattoo artist. Like, I would get this design tattooed on me today if I could. And it was just like this perfect combination of, of uh, you know, influences and factors. And it just clicked in my mind. And I was like, you know what? Yes, I'm going to do it and I'm going to just really devote myself and and study it and learn everything that I can about it and just go for it not not thinking oh I'm going to make a big career change it was just like this is something that I've literally dreamed about doing every you know for a very 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 long time uh tens of years and uh it was just this moment that I had that I was like I'm going to just pursue it organically I'm going to learn about it I have no specific plan um, and like part time on the side for the time being, you know, kind of yeah, just in, in my free, in my free time, not you that I'm just yourself that you're <laughs> truly are worthy. Yeah, I suppose. Well, I was just like, I'm going to, you know, f- learn about a machine and see how they work. We'll figure out what types of tattoo machines there are and try and just understand them. And it was a, it was a process and, you know, I ended up getting, uh, a kit off of Amazon, which I, anytime I hear other people say that I do cringe. Cause it's like, they don't send you good stuff on there. They don't send you stuff. that's just ready to tattoo on, on human skin. Um, but it's what I used to sort of just figure it out. And it wasn't available to me financially or, you know, s- schedule wise or anything to try and pursue an apprenticeship a traditional apprenticeship anywhere because, you know, my job was kind of the reason my family was able to eat food and (laughs) live. (laughs) So, so I kind of had to keep that during the day. And so the only times that I was able to learn about this new subject was in the evenings and weekends. And, and yeah, you know, this was five years ago and I, I really devoted myself. I stayed up, late every night you get my kids to bed and then have a little visit with my wife and she'd go to bed and then I'd stay up probably from about 9 30 or 10 at night until two in the morning virtually every day learning and studying and trying to understand this world of tattooing and practicing with the machine on fruit and second skin or not second skin uh, synthetic skin they make like a like a silicone skin that you can tattoo and yeah and you punished yourself i well you know i did have a mentor i have a my kind of an old friend is i sort of tagged along with my brother growing up so she was his really good friend but you know i consider my friend too because i was like there all the time yeah yeah (laughs) and she it was an established tattoo artist of many years. You know, she'd already been tattooing for 10 or 12 years by the time I talked to her about this. And I just, you know, she lived in New Brunswick and there's no ability to hand, you know, one-on-one hands-on mentor. But I approached her and I asked if there was any way she'd, you know, sort of guide me. Carve some and time I, up yeah. to answer questions. You, you know, yeah. And I... <laughs> I'm very familiar with the tattoo industry. And so I kind of knew what I was doing was generally speaking frowned upon, you know, it's, you teach yourself tattooing, you can make some bad habits, not to mention 
really put people at risk because you're dealing with blood. You're dealing with people's blood, and it's just a naturally very. It's a, there's a lot of hazards in the work, and the stakes are high. You know, you're altering people's skin forever. Yeah, man. And so when I approached this friend, I I told her like I was like, listen, I know this is probably going to come off insulting. <laughs> and I don't mean for that to be the case, obviously. And I just want you to know that this is something that I'm like really devoted to putting the time into uh, and respecting it as a craft and having the integrity to pursue it in all aspects and angles that were available to me in my current, you know, familial financial yeah. situation. Yeah. And you know what? She saw where I was coming from and she thankfully agreed to kind of just help give me the most critical pointers of like what to do where you know she's like first things first don't even think about touching a human body until you take a reputable bloodborne pathogens and infection control course good advice uh, you know yeah. good advice same advice i would give absolutely yeah. Yeah. and so yeah i enrolled in actually they had a program through nate uh and that i was able to make time for and do and so and it's something I, tangible, something you're like, it was, hey, this is a it thing. It was a learning, yeah. Go it was on a course. wall when I'm done. Yeah, yeah. And it's one more step towards. Exactly. And so I did that. And luck, you know, I, I've i been a health and safety professional for seven years in a number of different industries. And so, you know, that was, it was something that was actually it kind of important to me. <laughs> and I see the value of, like, you know, I know there's jokes about safety guys and stuff and I'll accept every one of those jokes because, you know, there's it's a reputation for a reason. But um, but the bottom line is just, like, you know, if you don't identify the hazards at a workplace, like, some bad shit's going to happen. Eventually. And, yeah, Another and time. so when I was, like, going to take this on, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to make damn sure I'm not going to give anyone hepatitis <laughs> or, you know, send anyone to the hospital on IV <laughs> antibiotics or anything like that. And Super so, courteous of you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah. And then kind of, I was like working on it and I wasn't forcing any aspect of the progression. It was just, I was just trying to learn. And then I had a cousin, one of my many cousins just like volunteered. He was like, just like tattoo me, man. Just like, and I was like, I was fully up front with him where I was, where I was at with things. And, and, uh, he's just like, just do it. We'll do it. And so, uh, you know, I set up a safe clean space in my home and I got the <laughs> I got all the hospital grade cleaners and you know I d did spend a, a, a lot of time learning how to do it and so and I, mean, I was like but I can't guarantee the product here because I've never tattooed on skin it's the bottom line he said just go for it so we did it and it turned out pretty good and uh, yeah more of my family members kept volunteering and it was a very steep like learning curve, but I was just feeling positive about what I was doing and how I was doing it. And pretty soon it just snowballed and I was getting requests from strangers and I was like, Oh man, like I don't want to have strangers. Like if I'm not like fully licensed here. And so I contacted the health inspector and the health inspector said, well, okay, you need to have a permit, like a business permit through the city. And so I kind of did this thing where I was like, okay, well, I've got to apply for this permit to run it out of my home. And, and, and I did, it was a kind of a long process, but you know, when you run a business out of your home in the city, you kind of have to get the approval of your neighbors. And so the city sends them a, you know, an opportunity to decline mm -hmm. having a business in their neighborhood. Yeah. And I was like, I was like, oh man, it was a tattoo business. I could imagine you know, just anybody saying, no, I don't want that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I kind of went and approached all my neighbors and asked them like, you know, and I told them just what I was up to. And I think they just got a sense that I'm an earnest guy and, uh, and uh, they all kind of approved it. And so I got my permit through the city and I got my business license and then got the health inspector over to check out my space. And he was quite pleased with it. And, uh, and then, so I started taking in, people that I didn't know and and all the while I'm still working my career that I've been at yeah you know during the my nine to five kind of thing and evenings and weekends tattooing and pretty soon it was I had two full-time jobs 
And I was like, oh my, something's got to give here because yeah. I have a wife and two kids. You know, at the time they were one and five. Yeah. And, uh, and it was snowballing and I was like, okay, well, something's got to give. And I was just feeling good feeling. about what I was doing and kind of like, I suppose, approaching the place where I was ready to take a leap. And uh, I had a friend at the time who was running a space in town and she had a storefront tattoo shop and she invited me to come guest there. And I worked as a guest artist there and uh, it just snowballed. It just, I, at first I thought, okay, maybe in a year I'll make the transition. And then it was like, or at first it was like maybe like five years. Then it was like a year and then it was like six months. And then after a, really only a few weeks, it was like, okay, I got to give my notice at my other job and, you know, take, take the leap and just hope it works out. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I asked my for my wife's support, and she was not, I don't want to say hesitant. She was very supportive. She just looked at me and asked me. She was like, do you think this is the right time for this? And I, I was like, I have no ability to indicate the rightness of this yeah, <laughs> besides my own intuition. I can't show you, yeah. like, <laughs> X and Y suggest right now. Yeah, but I just sort of went, as I had this whole time, just kind of been guided by my intuition and my own... Uh, sense of what I should do and and so I did I, get, I gave this I gave this company two months notice because I had been there quite a long time and I knew that it wasn't going to be easily replaced big, there big high vis vest to fill <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah right so to speak yeah yeah and uh yeah so I phased myself out of there and phased into this tattoo shop and she made it really easy. I mean, I'm very grateful to her for that. She made it very the transition very easy. She just let me basically rent a chair from her, which is a far lesser common arrangement in tattoo shops. Most commonly, it's a, a commission split. So whatever, uh, whatever I earned, you know, typically the shop would take sort of thirty or forty percent, and I would kind of keep the remainder of that and. Mm -hmm. um, or 50% a lot of time it's even 50 50 yeah because it takes a lot of money to run a tattoo shop it's the overhead's quite high for sure but she just made that transition easy on me so that I could kind of keep the a level of income that was commensurate with what I had been earning before and supporting my family on and it was made the transition easy and luckily the for me as well the public was Receptive. Receptive. Yeah. And wanted to keep booking. And so I'm okay, so eternally grateful for all that. We got all the way from high school band mm -hmm. writing music to a couple of years ago. Yeah. You can let's finish. You can cut out as much no, as you want of that. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna high speed dub it. Yeah. So it's gonna sound a little little higher pitched and a little yeah, faster. That sounds good. My wife yeah. listens to books at double time. I don't know how she Oh, does I love it too, yeah. yeah I, I love do playback it. speed too ramping much that up. I've got things to do. Um <laughs> so that takes us to a couple of years ago, would you say? Where did we that takes me to line? yeah, a couple of years ago. Let's take it to like so, the moment you walked in the door today. We might as well fit we've, we've come guess. so far. Yeah. Let's, let's finish Should I off. back day go from like when I was a little, like a baby? Where, we do when need I was to born, Guy Ritchie jump back at some Guy point jump to, back. to really set <laughs> the, you know, origin story. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah, that was, that was a couple years ago. So I started full time at Bad Dog Tattoo, Bad Dog Tattoos in downtown Grand Prairie. Just had, you know, a great time. Great time. Loved working there. We just got on like a house on fire. So you're tattooing at a shop in town and then you're trying to figure out your future with your business, your art, everything. What was your next steps? Well, my next step really was just to kind of keep honing the craft. It wasn't, I wasn't intent on moving anywhere. Um, you're not going to rent a chair forever though, right? Well, no, I suppose that's right. In in the back of my mind, it was like someday I'd like to own a shop or be co-owner or whatever, at least 
be owner. The guy you described been, up till this point yeah. is not going to just be like, okay, now rest on my laurels and just exactly just kind of phone it in. Exactly. I mean, that's unfair to say phone it in, but like <laughs> not strive, not know that whatever I put in, I'm going to get out on the back end. So maybe I'm going to keep putting it. Well, out. that's you the know, guy you struck me as. That's not, even if I were to stay and not say create my own storefront business somewhere, the idea of sitting back and coasting was not at all the case. Cause like that's, that's what's, gl- what's so glorious about this career and, and the career as an artist in general is there is no ceiling at all. There's no ceiling and there's no walls, and, you know, yeah. you just, you can keep going. There's always something that's never been done. And there's always something that you're doing that you're not happy with that you can refine and get better the next time. And there's always borders and boundaries to push with the with the craft, and that's something that is in the front of my mind every single day. I try not to let a single day pass without thinking, "How can I make this better? And how can I get better?" And good. And so that's that was where in my the growth that I was looking forward to was in, into the craft and less less on a business side of things. Um, but a person is naive to think that the two can exist exclusively. Yeah, yeah. I suppose. Uh, and you're answering too many of my prearranged questions. I don't have that many. Okay. So you're tattooing <laughs> there. You're like, uh, what next for me? I'm I'm in a situation I didn't expect to be in so soon. Yeah, I'm, I'm giving that's true. notice before I was before you know our timeline that we've mm. decided upon. Um, obviously, you yeah, the wheels are spinning, and now you've opened your own shop. Now I've opened my own shop. Yeah. And and I again wouldn't have done it if I didn't have the the two coworkers that I have now. Cat Scratch Tattoos. Cat Scratch Tattoo Collective. Collective. And that's an important component of it because I really so <laughs> you know, I mentioned earlier the sort of different setups that a, a shop will have. How I said it's far more common to have a commission split. Um as opposed to a chair rental sure. situation. And that's typically because, you know, the business owner has been like, okay, well, I've invested so much of my time and my own savings to open up this shop, which as I found out is a costly venture. <laughs> and so the reason, you know, typically shop owners will have that is so that they're like, okay, well, I'll have some artists come in here and they'll work for me and, and, uh, they'll do their thing and they'll make a good living. Um, but I'll kind of get to make a little bit of money off of them. Um, and the collective aspect that I've sort of gone for here is less, you know, to make money off of them, but to sort of just keep them <laughs> and keep a good yeah. work environment that, cause we work so well together and I don't honestly don't know what I'd do if either of them went anywhere, it would be a far less valuable place to be. And far less enjoyable. And so, you know, I was like, oh, if I set this up right, it's going to be better for them to work here than to go open up their own space. You know, because a lot of the time, that's what tattooers will do. They'll just like, they come up at a shop, they apprentice, they learn, and they realize, oh, I think I think this person's getting too much of my money here, mm-hmm. so I'm going to open up my own I'm space. I'm going to get that entire 50% back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. All of it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And in the case of fifty fifty, you can yeah, that can be a lot. That can be a lot of money if you're busy. If you're if working, you're busy. If you're yeah, grinding. the thirty seventy. I think, you know, it's it cut. Like I said, it costs a lot. It, generally in a split thing. The shop owner is providing a lot of your consumable stuff, and they're covering, you know, maybe insurance or they're covering security. And there's a lot of back a lot of unseen stuff. That's, stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and so. Um, yeah, I kind of wanted to set this place up a little bit differently where it's kind of, yeah, more of a chair rental thing. Like what I had was lucky enough to get, mm-hmm. you know, when I moved into a shop and I yeah, do it's karmically responsible. Yeah, too. And I do know how lucky I am to have had that. It's a, not a common thing. And I, I just really want to emphasize how grateful that I am to have had that. Um, I wouldn't have been able to do, do it without it plain and simple yeah and so yeah that's kind of where i'm at june of this year 2023 
uh, opened up Cat Scratch Tattoo Collective. Well, hold on. One question first. You wrote your own songs. This is I used like, to write my own songs. This is like four chapters back in, yeah. in the in the previous Yeah, story. I used to write my own songs. Did you record them? I have. I have. Yeah, I did. I used to have a little terrible little recording set up in my track kind of apartment thing? in yeah. my... Yeah, well, I had a little mic set up for vocal and acoustic stuff, and I had sort of preamp stuff that I'd plug right into the computer and then Sweet. multi-track on a... Where is it now? System, you know, Spotify? probably SoundCloud? non-existent. No, probably it doesn't exist anywhere. I don't want to dive too far into that because I got questions about that. We'll come back to it. Okay. Um, right. The the quick and easy ones are... Um, practice routine. Uh, when you were talking about grinding in your... I pictured basement, but when you were working full time still and working till 2 a.m. on your craft. Yeah. What does, I mean, I'm using this from a music standpoint as all as the majority of my art experience. So it's always like, you know, rudiments and, and all the different kind of elements that comprise a, a person doing their thing. Yeah. Or are you just drawing lines. You just draw a straight line. I did an art a drawing course recently yeah. that wanted me to draw 10,000 circles, triangles, and squares. Yeah. I don't, I didn't, I didn't really him. do that. I've always actually tried to remind myself to be more systematic in my learning. So I definitely see the value. You know, when I see yeah, uh, YouTube videos, for instance, because like, there's some YouTube videos of people like, this is how you tattoo. I'm going to make a course on how to tattoo. And they'll post the whole thing on YouTube. And a lot of the time, yeah, it's kind of like, do a million straight lines. Yeah. Do a million squares. Yeah. Do a million circles. What did it look like for you? And I, I think that that's valuable for me. Uh, I did sort of, sort of bring myself up to do more systematic stuff, but typically it was, it was uh, design what I thought was a cool design. Put it onto a piece of fruit. It. I was very excited about the design aspect as I was learning the technical aspect of using a machine and getting transferring ink into mm -hmm. uh, skin or fruit skin or synthetic skin, you know. Um, like there was so, enough to learn that you even just, uh, maybe let me preface it with what I try to avoid in myself is like, once you start to develop skill in an area, you like, kind of lean into the thing that you do that's cool, you know, or the thing that's totally. easy or comfortable that like gets you that maybe it's a dopamine hit where you're like, totally. yeah, listen how sweet you know? that is. Yeah. And, and in order to like forcefully, you know, flex unused muscle is yeah. like to, <laughs> to drive outside of that. But um, sounds like you had enough, enough like mechanics of it to learn that you got to kind of do a, a more fun approach to it and maybe a I more did more creative fun approach. approach. I would call it a less organized approach and a less, uh, informed approach, you know, and this is, this is kind of where we come back to the idea of like self teaching versus an apprenticeship. And like, I really fully believe that the only reason I've got as far as I have in the industry, uh, or the base reason why I have is because I've devoted so much freaking time into doing 10, it. hours. <laughs> you know, yeah. Right. Zil, like, that's, that's what they say. I can't remember who says it, but they. I don't know. I'd have to get to a calculator. To sure, hell of a lot of hours yeah. learning and studying and like doing it and, and actually tattooing too. I, I work a lot of hours in the shop. Um, and so I think that's how, because I've been diligent, you know, I've been really devoted and I, I've, sacrificed a lot of other things to be able to just spend time doing this sacrificed a ton of sleep you know <laughs> yeah, i no go kidding. to bed at two or three in the morning and i get up at seven i because i've got to take kids to school in this yeah. so life happens when i used to sleep eight hours a night i've been sleeping four or five hours a night 99 percent of the time over the last four or five years but you know that's been self-teaching if i had someone that was like hands-on in the shop, like at, in my early days, it'd be like, no, 
like don't do this part that's sort of a waste of time you know do this like you kind of steer and guide and like and the biggest thing is troubleshooting like there's a million and one reasons when you're starting to learn how to tattoo like why why isn't this line going in Mm -hmm. you know whether it's synthetic skin or human skin or fruit or whatever it's like why isn't that like in my mind i planned it to look nice (laughs) <laughs> and as I as I carried yeah. it out, this but. is not the result that I expected. And you're like, well, shit. Like, is it because I didn't have enough pressure in my hand? Is it because the needle's not just variables? Eh? Out? Just, there's so many variables this, and so many this, factors this, to this, consider. This, yeah, this, angle this, this, and this, this. ink saturation or ink quality or RPM, uh, RPM voltage. You know, needle size. There's so many. Is it my power supply? Is this three hundred dollar thing that i bought actually just a piece of garbage or did i fry the motor on my machine by having too high voltage the first time i plugged this thing in or like what what the fuck yeah (laughs) what's going on here why isn't it working all question marks yeah and an experienced tattooer would be like you know generally speaking be like well yeah here's the problem or like they'll be able to quickly tell you no there's nothing wrong with your machine at least tell you what it isn't you know yeah, yeah maybe you're tired you've been tattooing yeah. at this for a while yeah. you're just you've been running off four hours of sleep every day <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i can only drink so much coffee yeah and so um i can't remember exactly where i was going with this. mentorship though mentorship legit. That's yeah legit. it's it's a legit thing yeah i think if, if you whatever know, it is if anyone's interested in getting a tattoo into the tattoo uh, industry. And it's such a double-edged sword. I really m- would recommend an apprenticeship because it's so valuable. It's, uh, you don't have to pay for it. It's, you know, you don't get paid at the start in most apprenticeship setups, but you get hand, you know, like one-on-one hands-on mentorship. And it's totally valuable. It takes a little ton of the guesswork out of it. Um, but it's at the same time, it's kind of a gatekeeping industry, you know, like apprenticeships are hard to get. There's only so many artists, mm-hmm. period. And then there's far fewer artists that are willing to take on an apprentice and uh, divide their time, you know, to divide their time. I think for a long time, that was sort of like a, a almost like an ecological niche or like equilibrium between like how many art tattoo artists there were and, you know, maintaining not having too saturated a you know a market for those that were wanting to get tattooed because as we see now a lot of a lot, you of, know, a lot of people are self teaching and they're becoming t- tattoo artists you know like and I can't I have can't I'd be totally hypocritical if I looked down on that um, because that's what I did um, but a lot of people are doing that and then there are popping up tattoo schools. Mm-hmm. Um, there is one in town here Mm -hmm. and you know, they, they get people registering in their course and I don't know how big their class sizes are, but it's a certain amount of people in their class that come and I think it's a relatively short program, about six weeks from what I understand and leave certified tattooer leave yeah you know they get a certificate of completion from the course yeah you know and i don't want to weigh in too much on a no but one of the personal one of the wonderful things about however you wherever you slant on that it's one of the beautiful things of this kind of like that no ceiling you were talking about before is the product speaks for itself at the end of the day that's right if you take a six-week course regardless of anyone's opinion of it and you're cranking out crispy tattoos and no one's getting hepatitis and you know <laughs> totally. the, the products there then who's to say that that's better than that's it's me making this it's making that album you know it's yeah. it's one of the few things in this world where nobody want nobody needs to see a piece of paper on the wall that you did the academia dance and you convinced some people that you knew what they said yeah, out loud to you over the last right. few months. You know, that's And you right. get to show that thing. Unfortunately, <laughs> there is a, you know, decided amount of, of shortcuts being taken in all industries. And that product is also to be viewed after and judged at that point. Exactly. So, yeah. And, and that's why I won't say too much about, um, 
you know my views on the on the school but it's it, what what the that alludes to such a positive vibe yeah and, and you know it's whether you go to a six-week tattoo school or you learn on youtube or or you do get an apprenticeship um one thing is for certain that if you're not willing to put the effort in you're not gonna get very good at it mm. my friend jeremy keeps telling me how he's not a very good guitar player i'm like well how's your practice every day going yeah i don't yeah it's like wow that's crazy yeah, yeah. that's too yeah. don't really shake out too weird because well, i expected to get better yeah without yeah I, I have a guitar <laughs> yeah oh yeah this is a fun one you already kind of talked about pushing your own boundaries but what are you doing um are, are you actively pursuing that outside of your comfort zone to try and try and expand your horizons? Are you aiming more for a niche uh, specificity or well, in terms of style? Yeah. Do style and how I work, you know, that's to answer that question. It's kind of like, cause like the work that I get to do, is the work that people ask me to do. <laughs> and yep. sometimes I can kind of weigh in and kind of steer things a little bit. So in terms of artistic growth in genre or style is, is kind of limited in it in the sense of like, I can only really do for a person what they're willing to get. <laughs> yeah. And mathematically speaking. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so I suppose one thing that I could do is draw things that I want to do and then kind of post them to social media and hope that someone yeah, gets it. Yeah. And I, and I do that from time to time, the bulk of my efforts in continual improvement as of late are scrutinizing the work that I'm doing and really figuring out in there what, I'm not entirely satisfied with it and kind of making those small tweaks. Yeah. Um, but yeah, every once in a while I get to a point where I'm like, hmm, I wonder if I should really try something like totally different. <laughs> and I do get to do that sometimes. Um, and it's fun. It's fun getting experimental like that. Um, and yeah, I go through these phases because I only have so much time between, as I said earlier, I put in a ton of hours at the shop. I have two kids, you know, my, and I, of course I need to spend time with my wife and our house always seems to have perpetually some sort of project that I'm also working on. Mm -hmm. um, and so, re yeah, the hours of free time that I have are basically 10 p.m., to 2 a.m. Sunday to Thursday. <laughs> so at this stage, you're probably finding those areas in what you're already bulk of your, you know, keep the lights on work, those areas where you're less than satisfied on tightening those up. Within the, ta within the tattoo medium, yeah. But sometimes I'll be like, go through another phase where I'll be like, hey, I haven't done any painting in a long time and it should be nice to have some nice paintings on the wall or it'd be nice to get better at painting. Um, Without just so expecting I'll, to be better at it a week or two down the road. No, well, no, that's, I bought paint. That's how it starts too. <laughs> if I definitely very disappointed if I'm not instantly good at a new medium that I take on like watercolor paint, painting, which of course I'm not instantly good at it because it's hard and you have to learn how to do things and yeah. it's frustrating yeah. and that and that's like oh shit okay well now i gotta like devote all this time to it and um uh, and it's hard because in that free time those whatever 10 p.m to 2 a.m sunday to thursday hours i also need to do all my bookings and emails and bookkeeping stuff and social media posts and and um what else Everything. yeah All drawing studying and i still you know when i when it's like what don't i like about my work and why you know it's like okay well what what how do i want this to look and so i you know or this specific tiny element of this overall design like i know i've you know i and so I'll look at thousands of images online of other tattoos and just s slowly get influenced by this massive 
body of other people's work. Like why, why isn't mine as clean as theirs? You know? Oh man, that's perfect. That, that um, (laughs) covers this question here. I have, you know, in, in this ever increasing pool of, of people creating, um, how do you set yourself apart from the crowd? And are you cognizant while you're designing of doing that? Or is it, are you letting whatever intuition, whatever, you know, the sum of your inspiration up until this point setting you apart? Are you going in deliberately going like, I'm not going to draw eyes like that, or I'm going to specifically make this thing different. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's without, with also trying to probably stay within the bounds of a genre and style and not try to blur some lines here, unless blurring the lines is well, the goal. Too. Blurring lines is, I, I, I always say you got to know the rules to break the rules. And that's when you're going to get the nicest product. If you're pushing boundaries in terms of style uh, and cause certain genres, you know, they kind of got like, if you do things, you got to know what changes to make. If you're changing a style for it to just look right. And this is a, such a vague topic cause it's just like, there's Big no question. established yeah. set of rules and there's no guidebook and there's no, you know, we're talking motifs like, you know, visual motifs. And you're making small changes and it's like you can make a small change in one way or the other. And if you make it one way, the design looks just like looks right. And if you make it another way, it's just like doesn't look right. And you're like, well, what the fuck? And so it's a very organic process of figuring out what does look right Mm -hmm. and look nice and, and cool. And, you know, and so it's like, it's this totally weird paradoxical thing where you have this entire universe of things that is entirely limitless that you could do. And there still is original stuff yet to be done, I think. Um, but, but for some reason you kind of have to still work with this limit of what looks right. (laughs) And so, yeah, no, it's constantly just like, And in terms of, I get in this feedback loop of like, you know, I'll be super stoked on something that I did, this tattoo that I did. And then I'll, I'll look at it and I'll kind of scrutinize and think like, what, what is it about this? that's not sitting right with me. And then, and then I'll look at thousands or hundreds of images of other tattoos in a similar genre. And I'll be like, why does that look right? And mine doesn't, I'll kind of scrutinize both. And then it'll make me feel far less good about this tattoo that I did than I than I felt a few hours earlier. Yeah. And then, you know, I'll say, okay, well, like, what is it about this? And I'll try and implement some small change. And then I'll, f- I'll f- again, feel that sense of satisfaction <laughs> the next day kind of thing with this thing, with this small change that I made. Oh, good. Sweet. Yeah. No, like that's, that's better. Um, and a lot of the time they're very, very small changes, but in my mind they're significant. And it's this like slow creeping process. It's like satisfied, happy, And then with the same product a few hours later or the next day or whatever, finding some level of dissatisfaction with it and finding an opportunity for growth within that. And I remember, I remember hearing this from a tattoo artist when I first started, he's like, you know, we're never, never, ever just satisfied with what we've done. And, you know, there's an impulse to think, Oh, that's shitty. But I think it's not shitty. It's really it's a motivating. good thing. It's motivating. Right. For the right person, it's motivating. Yeah, for right. the right person, it's motivating. For the right brain. I've never had... Uh, I think that's why I stuck with music for so long. Most other avenues I've pursued in my life, it's almost felt too easy, you know, mm-hmm. to like get through regular work stuff. And before you know it, you know, they, they want you to run things. And you're like, pretty soon I'm phoning it in. Not trying and excelling at this mediocre, you know, effort. And I, I drive myself insane with it. Yeah. Whereas I'm never happy with yeah. what I do on music. <laughs> All, not true. I'm happy periodically. It's yeah, like you get these glimmers. satisfactions. Yeah, where you're but, like, like, man, you'll work, I'll work on a song for like, I don't know, months. And I'll be like, this is the worst song ever. And you're just like, why did I spend so much time on this? You leave it alone and you come back to it and you're like, oh yeah, no, this is good. But there's just like, it's like this goalpost that never truly exists. That even yeah. when you think you're like, oh yeah, no, there it is. And you get there and you're like, 
you're looking around and you're like, there's, there was never a goalpost here. I'm just, it's satisfied. still just as far away from me than I, than it was yesterday or last week or last year. But the cool thing is that's just you looking forward. But if you, you know, take a step and look backward, you're like, Oh shit. No, I have been moving this whole time. Yeah. Yeah. And pull that cool. recording from 15 years yeah. out and you're like, Whoa. Yeah. wow. Yeah. And that's all you need. If you feel like a garbage artist, just look at what you're doing, you know, quite some time ago. If I look at work from a year or two or three years ago, it's like, oh, no, I am doing it. I'm getting better. Yeah. It's funny because <laughs> you're like, your metric changes. Yeah. You know, at the start, you're like, oh, man, this is, look how circle this circle is. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and then you're like, crush this circle. And then pretty soon you're, you know, doing whatever next level is. And your your metric is the other people at this level. And you're like, okay. And then all of a sudden you're now looking exactly. ahead again. Yeah. And you're like, I'm not, I'm not accomplished that. I'm not that mm-hmm. accomplished yet. And I think for those of us that look at it critically and make the effort to move forward, it's yeah. super motivating and super, um, I guess, fruitful where you get to constantly be learning. Maybe that's why we're, we have a lesser chance of, uh, brain failure when you're older like dementia and alzheimer's and that stuff is that right that's what they say is that musical instruments or you know are that the side of your brain that's getting fired on that is just flexing that muscle that's kind of keeping you okay you know keeping you fresh well i like that feel that's a nice feeling that i get from hearing that (laughs) Yeah. yeah well and we just have like you said there's so much out there there's different mediums there's different whatever there's yeah, everything. There's, there's just so many, whatever way you want to go with it. There's, you know, you could view it as, oh, there's nothing new under the sun, which is kind of true in a sense, but it's, it's, there's so many areas and avenues for growth. I mean, even taking one style, like say to compare it to music, you got a guitar riff that's just like the sickest guitar riff ever. And you're just like totally freaking stoked on this guitar riff that you have and you've written the song, but you're a teenager or something, you've written the song and you're like, well, I kind of like muted this part of that. You know, when I played it, it was like, it kind of just sounds, you can, you know, when you're a kid and you're writing music, it's just like, not doesn't sound professional. But then, okay, well no, I'm going to go to my buddy's house and we're going to like, we're going to like record it. And then like, you kind of record it and you're like, oh no, I kind of screwed it up there. Okay. We'll we'll record it again. Kind of like gets better. And so that's still like kind of grade one or whatever. And then as you progress and you get to a professional level, you're like, okay, we're not just doing the guitar riff. We're doing it on this instrument. We've chosen this instrument. We've chosen these strings. We've chosen the effects that are coming. We've chosen the production value of the ambient environment that the music is in, that the riff is happening in. And there's so many layers of refining really the product that, is in one sense the same as it was when it first started, but it is completely way more sophisticated, uh, you know, when you get to that level of high production value. And I guess that's what I'm trying to do with tattoos is increase the production value of what I'm doing. And if, if I'm doing a peony and roses, you know, I could do a peony and roses four years ago, but I'm might, do the same image with a much higher degree of production value yeah. now. And I hope to do it more so, you know, next week and next year. And yeah. That kind of thing. The beauty of your medium is that you get self analysis every day. Yeah. Like a few times a day, <laughs> you and that person and that mirror all get to kind of review your stuff right like yeah. immediately and then that person goes and sits on the crapper at home and gets to triple stare at it for <laughs> non-stop going like man this thing is pretty awesome um but that that's super valuable that's something i don't think other industries get as much where they're like you have to record it mm-hmm. you have to look at it record it look at it under, under a magnifying glass and go like yeah is this is this right is this is this exactly right is it am i satisfied with this yeah exactly and, or what could i do to make it a slightly higher production value. Totally. Yeah, that's yeah. good. That's good stuff. Yeah. I have a, what advice would you give to s- aspiring creatives embarking to be somewhere near where you're at? In a ta- in the tattoo industry? Yeah. Th- you know what? In the age that we're in right now, 
um, the art has to be the biggest thing. You know, I use this the the advice that I'm giving now versus a year ago. I think has changed. Um, you know, the advice that I used to give was just go to your favorite shops and frequent it, and just like keep going there until they say yes to an apprenticeship kind of thing. You know, because apprenticeship would just be the sweetest way to get going on it. You yeah. take a lot of guesswork out of it. You're taking a leap too. I think that's important, yeah. you know. Yeah. But now the advice that I would give would, sure, you know, go to the shops, find out which shops that you like, find out which ones have a good culture that you want to be in. You know, ideally you're getting an apprenticeship at a, sh- at a place that you want to be at, like go to every day. Because mm-hmm. there's environments at different places. You know, every shop has a different culture. Uh, you know, find a shop that has a culture that that aligns with you. Um, you know, if you get an apprenticeship at a different place, whatever. Just take it, and if you can learn from it, great. Ideally, you know, there's that can go wrong, too. If, you know, they go to the really wrong place, and then you're learning bad habits, or you could be unsafe. You're putting people's health and safety at risk as and, and your own. But, but really, the biggest thing when graduates are coming out of tattoo schools and people are self-teaching online and there's you know two years ago there was 14 tattoo shops in town i just looked the other day there's 31 google listings for tattoo shops in town so it's doubled in two years and so and that's all the ones that are on google like licensed and i'm sure there's more bedroom ones you know so and i'm thinking okay is the is the skill level in my mind the skill level has got to be pretty similar between a whole bunch of those so if you're going to stand out if you're going to want to enter the industry at all presumably you want to do it to be able to survive doing it make a living at doing it so the competition's high do you want to be just like everyone else out there if so then don't worry about your art just go and try and get in a chair somewhere and whatever but if you really want to stand out study some forms spend some spend fuck spend a shitload of time looking at genres there's so much to know there's so much to know i've been at this almost five years and i haven't scratched the surface of some of my favorite genres that i do as much as i can in my week fine line and traditional and ornamental those you know if i pigeonhole myself into three main styles which i still like to branch out from but i can't spend enough time trying to make my images look right Mm -hmm. and if a person wants to get into this and they want to be competitive if you make a portfolio of images that are a high production value on paper and digital both i definitely recommend a portfolio with both digital and paper uh mediums but high really high production value where your images look fucking good like really look good yeah you know, not only is that going to give you the best chance of getting the apprenticeship that you want at the shop that you want, but as soon as you start, man, like your stuff's going to be looking running. way better than it. You hit the ground running. Your stuff's going to be looking way better than anyone else. And it is the hardest part of the job is getting the art to look super sweet. Yeah. It's like, you know, I've like, like I've said, I've been doing this every day, all day for five years and I do it all day at the shop and I go home and I do it for hours at night. I put the time in and I'm still not, you know, I feel like I'm still, I could set, be set apart from other people more than I am now. And if, yeah, that would definitely, definitely be what I would recommend. Put together a really, really good portfolio where you're looking at images and comparing them to other professionals work in the field like compare yourself to some of your favorite artists online and if it's not looking as good try it again tomorrow yeah make it look better yeah keep at that i mean that's huge two hours put it in put it in put Put in the hours and that's there's no it just takes time is there anything more frustrating than when someone's like oh yeah I'm not artistically inclined or I'm not gifted in that way. Like this ain't a gift. This is blood, sweat and tears. <laughs> yeah. 
This is uh, sacrificed relationships and freedoms and all that thing. You know, just, to, just to, so that I'm content with myself on this. This is not a gift that's so underpinning the uh, amount of effort that's gone into this. There should be, uh, there should be a sort of a, uh, a defined difference between skill and talent. You know, people say, "Oh, you're so talented, so naturally gifted." <laughs> yeah. No. Well, if I'm known now as being a tattooer of pretty nice looking flowers, um, you would know for a fact that it's not a talent; it's a skill. Because if you'd have seen the flowers I used to drew, <laughs> draw three years ago, yeah. you would not have had a hope in hell for me to be any kind of artist. They all look. Doesn't matter what kind Clearly of flower it was; looked like a cabbage. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It wasn't even great. You You know, I actually practice my clapping pretty regularly. Mariah and I have gotten into making we clap therapy on the you know on the weekends. Often we'll have a little cocktail on Friday night, and it's become a a Moscow Mule. Okay. Oh man, fresh mint. Yeah. And ginger beer and lime. It's a vodka. You can make a virgin too. It's delicious virgin. But the best way to get the flavor and the effervescence of the mint out so you put a whole bunch of it in your palm and you just like on just like slap the shit out of it you know a few times and matt you smell your hands you can you put the mint in you sort of tear up the mint put it in the glass before mixing the rest of the ingredients but the whole room fills with this like amazing mint smell just it's want just some mint leaves hand on hand yeah, yeah did you hear that clap would that be adequate for that yeah oh. do it a few times yeah Ooh, right there that's a good one yeah it's just I've clapped before. Just, it's not my first clap. No, I know. You, I can tell <laughs> instantly you're an experienced clapper. <laughs> Moscow Mule, that, uh, that sounds Also delicious. delicious version. It tastes virtually the same version as it does with a booze in it. So. I've never drank anything with mint in it. Oh, oh boy. I don't think so. You know, I'm not like a really big, like, I don't like, I'm not like a peppermint tea. i will probably drink other teas oh, before a peppermint tea. It's not... Not generally speaking, my favorite flavor, but I straight up lied. Oh. I literally had a peppermint tea last night. Did you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I guess I've never had like a mojito or like a, a cocktail with mint in it. Yeah, but I've had peppermint tea. You know, but I'd suggest trying it. Give it a go. I'll write that down. Um, there's not a whole bunch left. I've. Um, is there tattoos you won't do? I will Fins. not tattoo. In terms of content, I would not do anything racist or homophobic or anything like that. You shit bag um, tattoos, gotcha. Yeah. That's an easy shit bag clean tattoos, one. Yeah, totally. Um, fuck those people. Fuck those people. Just like, don't even ask. I like everybody, but fuck those people. Yeah. One time I was asked to cover up a swastika and, you know, while of that definitely should be covered up i was just like i didn't have time to do it so i couldn't do it do it really anyway but i was surprised at how and this would lead into i guess my real answer to your question which is any i'll pretty much tattoo anyone anywhere that they want as long as i'm comfortable with them generally speaking if i'm comfortable with the person i'll tattoo where they want me to tattoo face you'll do face tattoos yep um, um i actually you met him before dave he and i grew up together he was he was adamant for a while about not doing just anything that was exposed. He would, mm-hmm. and I mean adamant to the point where it's like, "Are you sure?" And then you go, "Yes." And he goes, "Okay." Yeah. <laughs> like when he tattooed my hands, he was asking me about that at that time, and it was like, right. I had lesser tattoos at the moment, so he was decidedly hesitant for my own benefit too. But I, that was the first time I ever heard of it, so I was wondering if, yeah, yeah, if there's something you won't do. I mean, thematically, obviously. Shitbag tattoos, nobody should do those. There right. would be none if nobody did them. Yeah. Just saying. That, that's right. That's how that Solve works. itself. <laughs> that's how wouldn't have to cover up any if they weren't done in the first place. But yeah, as far as, yeah, you know, if someone wants a spider right here or something, you'll give her eyelids? Would you tattoo an eyelid? You know, like. Inside a mouth? Have you ever done a lip tattoo? I have done a lip, inside the lip tattoo, Ouch. actually. Tattooed, tattooed the word daddy. One time on the inside of a woman's <laughs> lip. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah, girl. And to each their own, you know? Yeah. Whatever. I didn't I didn't ask if it was a dedication to uh, the immemorial or her family <laughs> member or if it was How do you to tattoo do something it? else. But. Do you tattoo it so that they can kind of 
pull it out and see it? It's actually kind of like, you a, like invert it so you can see it in a mirror. It's kind of like our audience participation thing. Like normally as I'll do a tattoo, someone just like sits there and watches me do their tattoo. But in the case of an inner lip tattoo, I have to employ their hands. Like I kind of, oh, so I, gotta, so I gl- wash there? their hands and glove up and stuff. And, and, uh, and yeah, they kind of hold their own lip and point it outwards and this is how i did it anyway maybe there's another better way to do it but um yeah they kind of so and i put their arms kind of on this armrest so that they They were nice and stable and and then i kind of you know reached in there and but orientation wise which way does it write oh i say daddy or you know okay so typically whatever it says does it say so so you can read so that person can read it in most cases we're tattooing say script or something like that. anything that is like orientation specific so as the body is standing naturally arms and legs at rest and everything we're doing it so like it would be the correct orientation when the body is at rest mm-hmm. so like it would say daddy to her if she was reading it but but she wouldn't be able to read it so this is one of those rare yeah. cases where you know no it's 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 legible is, when it's pointed out at you. Yeah, this tattoo's for other people. <laughs> yeah. This one's not for me somewhere. Yeah. It's like a back tattoo, kind of. Yeah. Right? Where you're like, I have the worst tattoo on my back, but it doesn't matter. No, I can't, I can't see it. Yeah. It doesn't matter. I know. I got my first tattoo on my upper back. I did like it at the time, whatever, 20 years ago. I haven't seen it since. Yeah, that's how it works. Yeah. That is sometimes a wonderful saving grace. Yeah. <laughs> Which that makes me think of some other questions too. What's your first tattoo? Do you have any, f- and do you have any bad tattoo stories? Uh, I wouldn't say any decidedly bad tattoo stories. No, my first tattoo is a Celtic knot that I designed from scratch myself, and I designed it for my brother and my cousin and I. So it's kind of like this interlaced tripartite design. So it's kind of got like three sort of. It's you can sort of tell the theme of three in it, um, and it's kind of we were very very close, and our oh, we are very very close. But at the time, my cousin and I had just moved to Vancouver. My brother was already there, and we were like super super tight. We we're just like, man, this is like this is what life is all about, and we're together. This is like we're making moves, and life's, yeah. life's happening. And I was like, yeah, I'm gonna design this, and we're gonna get it all tattooed. It's gonna be like our brotherhood tattoo. And they're like, yeah, sweet, that's cool. And then, so I booked the appointment. I got it like pretty big on my back. Like it's definitely, I don't know, eight or so inches in diameter. It's kind of a circular thing. It's a pretty yeah. decent sized thing. For your first tattoo, that's a big for my tattoo. first tattoo, yeah. yeah. And so I went, and this guy downtown did it, and he was pretty chill. I, I don't really remember, you know, any of his techniques or anything. He was a nice enough guy, and. He put on that 70s show for me to watch while he was doing it. it was <laughs> Generous. Good. Yeah. And uh, the funny thing about that is, like, I designed this brotherhood tattoo, and they never ended up getting it. <laughs> oh, no. I, jerks. I, I felt that was part of the story. Yeah. In there. yeah. Was, you knew I was going there. I, I, I hope sense. you weren't. Yeah. For the brotherhood. But theme. you could just feel it. <laughs> it's, just, it's just like, <laughs> but it the doesn't only end way there. this could come down is it's, that. The story doesn't even end there. Like, so well, I was like super into, I was in university and I was studying uh, archaeology and anthropology. And I was one of my favorite subjects or, or areas of the study was uh, ancient cave paintings. And to me, that's like still the most interesting subject in the world because it's like, when did humans start doing stuff that wasn't just like for survival? It was like, yeah, just like, when did art start yeah it's this doesn't crazy. help me it's so cool in any way eat yeah survive it's you not know, like really a written nothing. language or history or maybe it could have been the, the trouble is there's no ethnographic record we don't have any uh oral tradition or any kind of thing that has actually traveled through time from the original people that did these things to to us to give us any true sense of the reasoning behind what they did but it's tens of thousands of years old in a lot of cases and it's like really actually very sophisticated techniques like as an artist when you look at these and and this has been written on by a lot of professionals and 
art historians and it's like it's you know it's a body of work that is highly respected as a sophisticated thing that was executed with a lot of intent and planning and great deal of trouble uh to to do um and so yeah that you know that's a whole other probably podcast probably because i that's my favorite subject ever so i was getting i was designing these tattoos for myself that were these ancient cave painting motifs and you know that's because i wanted to represent like how cool it is and the, yeah. they were all associated with their own meaning to me so i got these like sort of undulating wave patterns and you know me assigning my own meaning to it because that's all we can really do so my own meaning was kind of like everything's like a wavelength you know where our light spectrum we know that our light spectrum is like so our color spectrum is a part of our light spectrum and we know that we can see the color spectrum with our senses and then we've got these other instruments that tell us that there's this much more to the light spectrum like our uv and stuff ultraviolet light mm -hmm. so we know we can measure these other lengths of the light spectrum with our instruments and then we know that there kind of is more too that we can't really measure and so i think that's kind of just a theme you know just like vibes in life you know vibes waves and i think it's, it's something that holds true for sound for light for ultimate reality yeah and oh, yeah. so that's why i got that one and then i got these other ones and i got this when you that. designed a cave painting I, it's theme. like yeah cave painting themed tattoos that i did and so i designed this one that was a it's an armband and to me it was like oh, a circle and it's like just circles like one of the most fundamental oldest motifs used in cave paintings and to me it's like okay well like completeness which is i expanded that in my mind to, to be like live without contradiction something that is is consistent all the way through <laughs> yeah and so this idea of non-contradiction so to me it was like oh man i've got this super profound meaning to this tattoo and it was in the age of like western tattoos being tribal tattoos being very popular and that kind of thing so it was like this black bold armband which was fine okay to sit, be situated within this like wider theme of tattoos that was happening but to me it looked really cool and so i booked this appointment for it and then my cousin was like i gotta come home and he was like oh that's sweet that's a cool that's a cool tattoo I didn't tell him really about the meaning behind it. I was like, I'm just getting this arm. And he's like, I'll get it too. And I was like, yeah. and then he was like, when booked the, the appointment. <laughs> and I was like, what? Like, why? What are you talking about? He's like, wow, it's kind of like a band, like Band of Brothers, man. It'll be like a brotherhood tattoo. I was like, man, I designed a brotherhood <laughs> tattoo for us. Like, the and the, it's funny, uh, that kind of came full circle too, because like he got it. And then my, a few other cousins ended up spontaneously getting it, all without consulting me. No, this, all these things arm happen. Armband or Celtic? The armband oh, thing. Yeah. And so then I've got like, I've got a pretty big family on my mom's side. And we're all, we grew up quite close like not always geographically but i guess considered ourselves close and now a whole bunch of them got this like same exact armband <laughs> and so it kind of has turned into this like brotherhood thing which is kind of cool because we do see each other as very kind of like brotherly yeah, figures plus, in our i mean on your like i guess existential panning out the ten thousand years ago caveman putting this on the wall probably didn't expect to inspire 2007 Josh to get a armband. Yeah. But now that has affected your tribe. Yeah. And 10,000 years from now, there might be somebody looking back at that going like, yeah, they really, you know, they like these circles. <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly. you know, or for some way, that's, that's where yeah. my head goes on that. Yeah, and it was cool. Like, so after I started tattooing, my brother hadn't got any tattoos, and he was like, "Well, man, I gotta get this like armband." So I, I tattooed the armband on my actual only biological brother, which oh, was pretty man, cool. That too. is full circle. So, full circle. Better. <laughs> Can't believe we got that. I know that's so wonderful. At long last, I know my stories cannot. They do not happen linearly. Yeah, Guy Ritchie would be impressed. Yeah. <laughs> No, I way. think I wish you would be asleep by I, now. But, um, oh. I didn't expect to get into cave painting when we started. When the question was, "What was your first tattoo?" But we got yeah, there, and then we came we back all the way to 
We did. To today. Big round circle. <laughs> <laughs> Do you... Oh, um, I have two questions, two additional questions related to gear. Because mm-hmm. I love gear. I, I love, love gear. guitars, guitar-related yeah, things. I love, gear. I love computers, that kind of tech stuff. Um, so there's two questions. I kind of know the answer to one of them. Digital art tools. Yes yeah. or no? And yeah. And do they... Do they pump up or um, because do they do they inflate or you know create artifice? Like I know with one of I think it was Procreate or one of the tablet drawing programs um, my daughter uses. I was using it and you can like I think you can hold a button while you're drawing it, it makes a perfectly straight line. Yeah. I'm never gonna make a straight line, and I'm now <laughs> like. I would never have to learn how to make a straight line if I ran through that. Digital yeah. art tools, yay or nay? So, in a sense, a crutch is a tool. <laughs> <laughs> if you had a broken so, okay, leg. Okay, so yeah. we got, you know, yeah. So we got these things that, and it's, I think I would just bring it down to how, how you use it. And, uh, you know, but that's, it's all going to come out in the wash if you if you make a if you depend on shortcuts too much or you depend on the technology and you're making you can only make good art on procreate and you can't do it in tattoos that kind of sorts itself out i mean i that when i said earlier for an apprentice to make a portfolio of digital art and hand drawn art i think that's super critical not just like for like none of what i'm telling you you should bring to a tattoo apprenticeship interview is for me it's for you like if you draw on paper a whole bunch and if you learn how to use digital mediums like procreate and stuff it's gonna be useful to you you know you have to be able to draw so whatever if you can't you know if you can't end up drawing a nice smooth line after practicing it a thousand times like i don't know are you going to be maybe keep practicing? I guess you got to yeah. keep practicing. So, um, I mean, that paper you know, will tell you, yeah, the paper will tell you, but you know, the reality too, is that man can, some of these tools save us an immense amount of time. And it's kind of comes back to that. You got to know the rules to break the rules thing. If you're, if you're depending on too much on these shortcuts and you've never had to do it yourself, then you know, how much, how much skill, are you developing? I don't want to get too vague with this, but you got to know how to draw on paper. And, you know, yeah, I think if an apprentice is going to get hired on, if I'm going to hire an apprentice at any point, I'm going to be like, you should have an iPad just because like, you know, and that, and I don't want to be too opinionated on that too. Cause there's old school tattooers now that are doing the, their hand drawing things and they're using their light boards to trace and make stencils. And like, that's cool. Whatever. If you want to do that, it's an immense amount of time that it takes to do that comparatively, mm-hmm. especially if you're doing really technical stuff, like symmetrical work or mandalas and that kind of thing. Like I used to draw all my mandalas by hand and I have my protractor out and my rulers and I'd mm-hmm. spend three hours drawing a grid in very light pencil upon which I would design my mandala and then start drawing. Then start drawing. Yeah, exactly. And so I've done that. And now I can't do that. I can't afford to, I don't have the time in my mm-hmm. schedule. And if I devoted the time, it would come at the expense of so many other things. And so if I'm that that's customer thing. too, I, if I'm coming to you from mandala mm-hmm. or a geometric design to that degree, I'm seeking precision. I'm seeking, you know, printer like computer precision yeah I, i'm i'm not looking for uh, that, that specifically i think that's a a tenant of that design is isn't you know loose lines right so but again i don't think that that's necessarily the distinction because like if you can't draw it on paper perfect how are you gonna draw how are you gonna tattoo it on someone's skin so you should be able to do it with precision on paper certainly but i, I mean think. as far as like getting to the stage of making a stencil yeah you know i i don't need I need that guy to have it proven on skin for me to go there and right. get it. But I don't need him to recreate it. Right. You don't it. need to, it's not for the client. Like, yeah, you don't need me to be able to draw it to have the image exist on paper first before going into yeah, the exactly. stencil and going onto your skin. Yeah, that's a good point. And so, and that's like, that's kind of the biggest thing. Like, 
your competition out there is going to be using these tools that are saving them an immense amount of time. If it's saving them time, you know, you st- yeah. They you're can, getting you more can tattoos use, in a day. You're getting you more get reps more, in a day. Or you can practice more. You can yeah. study more. You, you know, the, all the time you have as a professional artist that you're going to be using on the craft, you know, efficiency is a pretty good thing. You can, I mean, that's the one thing. I appreciate your time today mm. because that's that one finite thing that we can't get one second of it back. Mm-hmm. So do you want to spend it, you know, redoing a thing you know you can do already or yeah. efficiency, you know, leaning into your the next thing? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I think it's, you know. It's a hard yes it's a, for me. Yeah. Having the good gear is totally. So I, then, I pay for good programs <laughs> the, the follow-up question then which is kind of gear related uh do you have a favorite piece of gear and the question's kind of two-sided do you have a favorite piece of gear for function and do you have a favorite piece of gear that has like a sentimental or heart attachment to it um well this could be you know my like design stuff like my ipad and stylus and programs on the ipad or my like tattoo machines anything themselves yeah, yeah you, go, I, uh, you can it can be a favorite hat that you wear while you do it yeah um how about for function first uh one that i always use as an example is recently these evertune bridges were created and they mm-hmm. are when i'm trying to like get an idea into the computer. I don't have to worry about tuning overdubs are super clean and super easy. So like workflow wise, it's yeah. taken tuning out of the equation. Right. Uh, so everything's perfectly intonated. It sounds great. As soon as I pick it up, no matter what. So my, my like concept to proof of concept into a computer is mm-hmm. like shorter than it's ever been. Yeah. So I get way more done because of that piece. Right. So that, that's where I'm questioning on the function part, like yeah. productivity or, yeah, like so productivity. So, you know, getting a nice clean stencil, for instance, like so much of my work is is freehand drawn right on skin. So I'd say my favorite piece of gear these days is Jiffy markers or Sharpie oh, markers. Nice. So that's yeah. like totally sweet. A couple of things that I use like on the tablet, most tattoo artists have Procreate, um, which uh, can create nice images. Like, you know, it's kind of like Photoshop with a stylus on, a, on an iPad. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't, for me it's like i don't know i don't have the time to i don't need to create a perfect gallery quality piece on the ipad just to be able to create the same image on skin i'm pretty much like i'm gonna go pretty loosey-goosey bare bones design on the tablet um and i'm gonna just ask you like Hopefully you're trusting the process here because I'm not showing you a really finalized mock-up um, of a design on the computer before we start, you know. And I don't just to get into that. I don't really pressure. I don't pressure people into getting tattoos, but it's a lot of the time it's very collaborative. There. And yeah, good. so uh, Procreate is a super great tool for you know if if you need to, for instance, trace uh, someone's grandmother's writing or something. It's yeah. just like take a photo of it, you trace it. It's just like exactly the same tickety boot takes two seconds. Like, you know, sometimes you can do it on a piece of paper and you're tracing on stencil. And it's just like, I don't know. I think you did Maybe it when we were doing example, uh, placement for some of the pieces on my leg. Yeah. You took a picture of the placement, leg. Yeah. And you like kind of like moved it yeah, around. Yeah, I do a mock up. Like, that's like, great. That's, Gap filling, that yeah. kind of a thing. Or Being able um, to have that like photo layer underneath with yeah. this one, like the opacity up so you can. You yeah. Know. Or resizing. So like you make a tattoo, make it spend hours drawing this freaking image or like however long. And then you made a stencil out of it. And then it's like a big piece. And it's just like, oh man, it needs to be resized to be like an inch bigger. It's like that's gonna fucking take forever <laughs> yeah. to yeah. redo it. And so yeah, just like bring it into Procreate, just like well, just the size, two seconds, reprint it, away you go. Yeah, that's, that's killer. Yeah. So that iPad, iPad, and time, slash time markers. saver. Yeah. yeah. Um. So then, is there one that's? Do you have a special to your close to your heart one? Um. Not really. No. I have a kind of a toolbox of 
tattoo machines that I will choose one for one type of work and another for another type of work. And a bunch of them I hardly ever use, but they look cool and I don't want to sell them because they all kind of have sentimental value, even though a lot of them I don't use at all, but I love the look of them. I I guess at this point, they're all kind of in the start of your career. Would you yeah, say like because yeah. you're? I mean, I'd love. To, I can't wait to see five more years down the road with your work ethic. Where what you're going to be doing? Where you're going to be at? Thanks. I think it's going to be. Uh, I, I'm excited to see it. I think it's going to be. I think we're gonna, you're going to impress both of us. Thank you. I have a, a strong confidence in that. <laughs> um, to wrap this up, uh, one more time. Where do people find you to get custom tattoos or a booking for? something or yeah where where is the best place to find you online so, or otherwise yeah online or in the store i mean you could drop by the shop and say hey and check out you know it's i don't ever mind when people come just drop by the shop and say hey and check out what kind of a space it is yep cat see scratch if, tattoo, cat scratch collective. tattoo collective in the bell tower plaza across the street from the old canadian tire nine eight nine nine one twelve that Across the street from the old Canadian Tire. Yeah, that's a deep. Yeah, everyone's gonna it's know. Deep cuts. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, and then Instagram. What's your handle? Instagram uh, is at Josh dot Matt dot Tattoo. Okay. Perfect. I will put that. On the My name too. is Josh, not Matt. I don't know why. I don't know if it's like some people just gloss over the Josh part because a lot of the time people will greet me over Instagram and say, "Hey, Matt." Yeah, weird. Which is kind of like fine. Matthew's my middle name. That's why I have it. It's actually a pretty dull Instagram handle and I keep daydreaming about changing into something way cooler sounding. Yeah, but you got a pretty decent little... Can you just change it? And then yeah. everyone that's already following is just yeah. massaged into it? Are you allowed to do yeah, that? Yeah, you can do that. Okay. Yeah, you can change your Mine's name. Mine's boring too. Yeah, it's... I don't know. But I haven't th- thought of anything good yet. Yeah. Anyway, we're kind of getting off. You can, you can message on Instagram... It's not the best place to get a hold of me because I tend to get lots of messages. Yep. And sometimes things get lost and I feel rude by ignoring. Where There's is a, where is the best place? The right? best place to get a response, and again, likely will take some time, is uh, by email. So there's a my email is, I'll just tell you it's through our website because it'll be easier to find our website, catscratchtattoo.com. We'll link um, Instagram, there is also a link to a booking there's a booking link in, on my main page there um i've started to do this thing where my books are kind of closed most of the time and then i'll kind of open them for a short period so everyone will send me their requests for new projects in that time and then i'll kind of go through them and that process can take i don't know a few weeks to right now i haven't still i did open them about a month ago and i still haven't got back to quite all the requests so Amazing it can take guy. a little time but you know, I I ask for your forgiveness in advance for how much time it might take. Uh, we spoke a lot about apprentices too. Mm-hmm. If there were potential apprentices with a tight portfolio, both in digital and traditional medium, would you like them to send a portfolio to you at that email address as well? Yeah, or bring it in person. That's you'll look at whatever kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, bring it in person. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Vibe check. Totally. Cool. Well, thanks again, Josh. Thank you. If you guys out there need tattoos, we're going to go uh, to Josh's website or Cat Scratch Tattoos Collective in person and chat with the guy himself. I'm going to quickly mention that I'm not the only tattoo artist at the shop. I work with two amazing artists, uh, Lorena Shakotko and Justine Vanderkay, Benny Vanderkay, both incredible artists incredible artist justine has been tattooing for like 14 years she has a ton of experience she is amazing it's so many different styles uh lorena has not been tattooing for very long and i cannot believe how amazing she is at tattooing for her short period she's gonna blow past so many people it's ridiculous it's so clean so tidy the design is always just on point i couldn't speak highly enough uh of these two a couple go, more they, tattoo artists yeah go go if uh it's worth checking them out go check them out and get some work by them too because yeah. they're unbelievable 
Maybe we can convince one or both of them to stop by for a chat too. I would be very surprised. <laughs> They're good on one-on-one in person at the shop. I'd be surprised if they wanted to broadcast themselves, but that's fair. It's kind of part of your game. I don't want to speak. I don't want to speak on their behalf. A hundred percent. And we're like, this guy's having so much fun with this. There's no way that we're going in there and we're just looking to have fun too. (laughs) Yeah. We went in because you were super chill and you were the most amazing dude to my wife possible. And thank you. uh, I'll forever be a fan, man. Thank you, man. That's so nice to hear. I'm so grateful to hear that thank you thanks again awesome thank you man it's been an absolute pleasure thank you